Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, aka Not Your Average Joel, and this video we're breaking down The Last of Us Episode 2. The series has had two really good episodes back to back, and as a big fan of the game, I've loved watching these first two entries. They do change some things up though, and throughout the video we're going to be going over the easter eggs, game differences, and also giving our thoughts on the series so far. Huge thank you to everyone who watched our video last week, and like that one, we're going to be saving the more spoilery easter eggs until the end so that people who haven't played the game can enjoy the twists and turns that come up in the show. I'll give you a heads up before we hit that, and we start the episode off in Jakarta all the way back in 2003. If you cast your mind back to last week then, you may remember that they did an announcement over the radio that talked about the city and how something strange was going on there. Here we see it playing out, with the outbreak of the infection being studied by a doctor. This wasn't in the game, and I like how the series is slowly filling in the backstory of the virus. Both the beginning of the last episode and this one had completely new bits in them, and it's possible that we might even get a story slotted in at the opening of each entry that gives us way more details on the infection than what we ever got in the game. Now when the title card's first shown, we can see this is taking place on September 24th, 2003, dating it two days before the outbreak. This of course shows how fast the virus spread, and in the game we learn it was through products containing flour and yeast, which we'll talk more about in just a bit. Huge shoutouts to Dynamic Smurf on our last video for pointing out that 2003 was potentially chosen because it was one of the hottest years on records, with a record-breaking heatwave happening that killed 20,000 people. The subtitles used throughout this part of the show also highly resemble the captions from the game, immersing us more in the Last of Us world. We start off with a sunny, seemingly normal day in Indonesia, which is when the military arrive and summon the scientists to a lab. Though the world is stabilised, the Last of Us storyline is filled with different militant factions throughout that all try to seize power to impose their rule. Fedra were of course a big part of these, and I love how in the backdrop there's always the idea of us versus them. This is echoed in Abu, who's pretty fearful that she's been taken in. She suspects they think she's committed a crime, but they want her because she's a professor in mycology. Mycology is the study of fungi, and she's the top scientist in the country after having graduated from the University of Indonesia. Ibu is escorted past a reception desk, and this actually leaked online when the show was in production. She walks past several vaccine advertisements as well, and these are all riffing on the We Can Do It poster. We once more get it hammered home that there's no cure, and this is why Ellie is such a paramount person in the story. Now Abu Ratna then examines the specimen, and she's taken to one of the infected that, that we can't show, can't show it, trust bloody HBO to have a fully nude woman, they can't bloody help themselves. Now the woman has a bullet hole in her head, and she clearly only stopped once she was shot. Around her foot we see a bite mark, and upon being opened up, this spreads out like the ones from Mrs. Adler's mouth last week. In her mouth are cordyceps as well, and it adds a really creepy dimension to the entire thing. Now I didn't want to bring up the clickers last week, as it could have spoiled some stuff for people who didn't want to know, but we finally get to meet some in this episode. They don't disappoint either, and through their biology we can see how the cordyceps work. They basically infect a person, and then they spread through their body, slowly replacing their cells with fungi, so they very much become almost like a living mushroom. My man Toadstool from Mario, he ain't got sh** on these, and the fungus eventually completely devours their brain and the upper part of their head. This makes them blind, and it's why the clickers are called that, because they use echolocation in order to see their surroundings. In the hotel, Joel brings up how the majority of the infected die quite quickly, but those that are sustained go on living for decades. This is very much the case in the clickers, with them being infected that have been around for decades, and thus the fungus have managed to take over most of their body and transform them into these monsters. I love the way that the cordyceps are located in the mouth here, and it hints at them slowly taking over the inside, but we can't tell until the infection is further down the line. Ibu Ratna has a cup of tea, and she learns that things started a flour and grain factory. Now the reason why I think Jakarta was chosen is because it actually has the biggest flour mill in the entire world. The Bogasari flour mill ranks as the largest on the planet in terms of size and scale, and thus this is likely why they picked here. Anyway, she refers to it as being the perfect substrate, and in biology, this is a term used to describe the surface in which fungus lives. Cheers, Google. Enzymes can also be found here that cause chemical processes, and this may be how the virus mutated to infect humans. Now, when it comes to how the fungus spread, the game mentions how it got into food, and a flour and yeast factory would be the perfect place for this to happen. When we look back at episode 1, there was actually a lot of food that would contain this ingredient that the characters in the show actually managed to avoid. We had moments where the younger Mrs. Adler made some cookies, and Sarah didn't eat these because they had raisins in them. I was thinking we'd make some cookies. Chocolate chip? Raisin. 
Mr. Adler could also be seen feeding the elderly Mrs. Adler, and this could be where the infection started out at. When offered some food, Joel also said, But I'm on Atkins. What now? Which, in case you don't know, is a low-carb diet, meaning that things that have a lot of flour and yeast in are completely avoided. Now, in the morning, Tommy was gutted that they weren't having pancakes because Joel and Sarah had bacon and eggs. Again, they're avoiding flour products, and they also didn't even have a birthday cake either, so the entire day was them just dodging bullets. I don't know if Joel... Well, not her. Now, I don't know if Joel would have completely slipped... <laughs> sorry. Now, I don't know if Joel would have completely skipped... I'm sorry. Now, I don't know if Joel would have completely skipped out on bread when food was sparse, but hey, at least they kept that consistent. He says the woman bit three other co-workers and that they were all executed, but that they don't know who bit her, and thus the virus is still out there. 14 other workers are missing as well, and there's not really any way to put a lid on this. Even if they lock down the country, the cordyceps have mutated now, and it's only so long before someone stumbles into them when they're out in the wild. She says that the whole city has to be destroyed, and we see how this strategy was adopted worldwide due to the craters later on. In the game, I, I always just assumed they were collapsed part of the streets due to the lack of maintenance, but you should never assume, because it makes a... Oh, so are you and me. Anyway, there's no hope, and she wants to spend the remaining hours that she has left with her family. It's a really bleak way to intro the episode, and we know that the following 20 years will likely hell on Earth due to how far the virus spread. It turned the infected against everyone around them, and even her going back to her family is something that she'll likely not experience again. Now, Ellie very much represents the hope for a cure, and this is shown symbolically with her sleeping under a literal ray of light that shines down on her. Joel and Tess sit in the dark, or as she's anointed, almost like it's a painting of Jesus or something. A butterfly flies over her, and imagery of these have appeared throughout the series so far. Butterflies actually carry their own meaning, and typically they're used to represent rebirth, transformation, and a change in a positive direction. Ali, of course, could be this, and she has the potential to cure humanity and take us back to the way things were, where everyone was nice in the YouTube comments section. When you use what all nice anyway. She's again wearing the same t-shirt that she had on last week, and if you missed that, then we thought it was put on to give a nod to young Nathan Drake in Uncharted 3. Not pulling that out of thin air, yeah, it has a reason, and Naughty Dog made both Uncharted and also The Last of Us games. Nothing but net. Now, they're still pretty sceptical over whether she's immune or not, and Ellie ends up having to go to the toilet. She's tossed a magazine, and in the game, she ended up coming across some beauty posters, which she was completely stunned by. That girl is so skinny. I thought you had plenty of food in your time. Oh, we did. Some just chose not to eat it. This happened just before the hotel, which we ended up visiting in the game, though it appeared way later on. Now, the entire scene takes place in a beauty salon, which completely f***ed, juxtaposing the idea of beauty against the devastation that the world's now in. We see Joel's hands trembling, which he diagnoses as a hairline fracture after beating the crap out of the guy last week. Hands trembling are of course a sign of infection, and it's something that Tess later has, so you can see why she questions it here. When she returns, they end up eating, and Joel and Tess eat some crap bars, I think they're called crap bars, while Stelly has a delicious chicken sandwich. This was given to her by Marlene, and it hints to how important she is since they're willing to give her what would be top of the range food in the apocalypse. Now tying back to the whole bread thing, it is possible that Ellie was given this because she's immune to cordyceps, and therefore there's no risk of her getting infected. Joel and Tess have to eat those crap bars because who knows what's in the crops, though that, that might be me going too far. Interestingly though, there was a real life case in France that happened in the 50s that could have inspired this. I've done a full in-depth breakdown on this in our video about how the infection started, which is up on the channel now. Now just for the cliff notes though, there was some ergot that ended up in bread and this caused severe food poisoning and hallucinations. There was a man who thought he was an airplane and he ended up jumping off a two-story balcony. In episode 1, the scientists said that there could be LSD-like hallucinations given, and this could tie back to that. Now, a child also attempted to strangle their own mother, showing how it could affect someone's rage. All in all, 250 people were affected by it, and 50 of these were condemned to an asylum. It's a really interesting story, and like I say, I've done a longer video on it, but the important thing to take from it is no carbs till mobs. But I'm on Atkins. Also, I was talking about this episode with Ryan Airy, bl bloody Ryan Airy, and he spotted that the first line in the entry is I apologise about your lunch. It brings it all together and adds to the food theme, but also f*** Ryan Airy, f*** him. Shut the f*** up, Ryan Airy! Ellie says they're trying to get her to an outpost out west, and there's going to be doctors there who can help work on a cure. 
Joel really doesn't believe this at all, and we'll talk in our spoiler section at the end how this sets up what's to come. Tess just wants to finish the job, but she's starting to gain faith in Ellie, and we can see her coming around. If Ellie is indeed able to help with a cure, then that would make her one of the most important people that have ever lived, but it just so happens that she's been slotted up with some, let's say, morally grey characters. Joel shifts a cabinet out of the way of the door, and often you drop these other ones when escaping in order to stop people or the infected coming after you. Speaking of the infected, I was sure I heard the sound effect of a clicker when they open up the door. Also, if you're enjoying the breakdowns, please click on that thumbs up button, and don't forget to subscribe for deep dives on the show every week. We'll be doing loads of videos on the series for newbies, and also hardcore fans alike, so you definitely don't want to miss out. Thanks. Now speaking of the game, they actually skip over a big section with the two skyscrapers. I was a bit gutted that we didn't get to this bit, as it's such a major part of the game early on. They also finished last week's episode by showing a shot of it to tease what was to come, and it's one of the most memorable parts of the game for me, so I, I was a bit gutted to see it cut. Now as we see from the skyscrapers, they'd probably be impossible to climb and descend in real life due to the angle that they're at. In the game, he climbed up one and descended down the other during the night, and this was all done to escape the Fedra camp. As you made your way through, you came across fresh bodies, and also encountered the clickers for the first time after seeing one grown into a wall. This is something that was teased out last week, and one leaps out at you as you open a door, and you have to navigate past them as you make your way through the structure. I'm guessing that they just wanted to have the one big clicker scene for the episode, and due to the budget, they probably thought that the museum later on would be the best place to do it. This too is a location that features in the game as well, with a Civil War display being a major part that we'll get into. Now in the game you have to climb scaffolding, and due to one of the skyscrapers being at an angle, they do some really cool stuff with the physics. Eventually, you make your way through a train station in what's one of the tensest parts of the game, before you finally escape downtown which is where you're swarmed by the infected. This is an awesome scene and they almost grab you from behind a shutter, and I had to hand it to them, I love this moment. Now in the show, they go the longer scenic route, and Ellie tours the city for the first time, looking at the bombing and what the government tried to do in order to stop the spread. They hit most of the big cities like this. They had to slow the spread somehow. So what happened here? They bombed the hell out of the surrounding areas to the quarantine zones, hoping to kill as much of the infected as possible. Uh, what the- Along the way, she walks past a stuffed giraffe toy, and these actually appeared throughout the game at several points. They showed up in Sarah's room, on the ground, and you'd often find them just lying about the place. They foreshadow a big thing coming down the line, and we'll talk about it in that super spoiler section, 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 exclusive spoilers. Now here they make their way alongside a highway littered with cars, and I absolutely love the look here. Really recaptures the game, turning this into an urban jungle where nature has taken over once more. Ellie brings up how she got bit, and this happened in a mall inside the QZ. This all took place in the Left Behind DLC, and Ellie says that she was just in there alone, which, again, super spoiler section at the end. We'll also be discussing some of the infected that she talks about here, and I'm guessing that this is all setting up what's coming down the line. Anyway, after hearing the cry of the infected, they decide to head into the hotel. In the show, this happens much earlier than it does in the game, with it not appearing until the Pittsburgh chapter. They really managed to recapture the look of it though, with the central stairwell and flooding being present. In the game, you made your way behind the reception desk and could catch a bellboy trolley, similar to what we see in the show. There's also a grand piano that makes an appearance, and it's here that Joel talks about his love for coffee. Ellie asks if they've ever stayed in a place like this, and Tess says, You ever stay in a place like this? Ah, uh, no, a little out of our league. Now this is a nod to the line in the game, when they first enter the hotel. Whoa, fancy. Uh, you ever stay in a place like this? Have you four? No. No, this is too rich for my blood. Now, Ellie also mentions that she can't swim, and it brought back PTSD flashbacks of all those wooden pallets floating in the water. Oof, never again. Um, just so it's out there, I can't swim. Well, I, I don't know how to swim. Seriously? Do you think we have pools in the QZ? Now Tess is dead at this point in the story, and I think they've included this bit as a nod to the game, and that it's highly unlikely we'll be returning here again in the show. This kind of sucks as it also has another big bit with the infected, but you know, with the show changing some bits and adding in others, we, we might get a payoff similar to that. 
and they end up ascending, which is when Tess climbs through a gap in order to unlock a door for them. In the game, you grabbed a ladder and navigated your way up the building, which is where you encountered some bandits. There were other things that we ran into, which we'll save for later, in case they adapt it into a later part of the show. Either way, here they use the time for some character development, with Joel and Ellie being forced into an awkward conversation. Joel is clearly a closed book at this point, and he lies about where he's from, and won't even answer whether he and Tess are an item. It's important to bear in mind that at this point in the story, Joel's pretty much just a shell of his former self, and due to the death of Sarah, he refuses to get attached to anything. He knows the pain that comes from loss, and his sole focus is on just making it through the day to day. Because of his past, he also knows that surviving means you have to do awful things, and thus he doesn't really like to make alliances in case it comes to a point where it's him or them standing in the way of tomorrow. Ali once more brandishes her knife, and this is the weapon that she uses throughout the game. Now out on the hotel balcony, the group look out and they see piles of infected. They're way more overpowered than what they are in the game, and we learn that they have an almost hive-like mind due to the fungus connecting them. In the game, if you killed a group of them, that was it, and you were completely safe. However, here, even if you kill one, they have the ability to reach out and call in the cavalry. The fungi work like a connected brain, and from the vast strains that live underground, they're almost like telephone wires joining up the locations. If one dies somewhere, it can signal the others, and thus the survivors are constantly on the run, trying to get away. In the show, killing an infected person doesn't mean you're out of danger, and I love this added dimension to them. Now this massive pile of infected could also tie in with episode 1. We of course open with a time jump by following a child trying to make their way to the QZ. They'd been with a larger group, and it's possible that these newly infected people here are where the kid broke off from. Now they also use the landscape to very much show the objective and where you need to head. Naughty Dog had some incredible level design, and throughout the game you'd often see where you needed to go, demonstrated by being yellow. In Boston they had the golden dome of the state building constantly off in the background, which is something that the show also does too. I've never been to Boston myself, but, but I've seen the golden dome in The Departed, and obviously it's a sign of status in that movie, so so yeah, the bit of info there. Haven't, haven't been to Boston, but I've seen The Departed. Five stars on TripAdvisor. Now realising they have no other way around, they go to the museum, which is ripped right out of the game. In there, there was a wooden beam that fell, blocking a doorway, similar to what happens later on when they get trapped. The game had this separating Joel from Tess and Ellie, and you had to navigate past clickers and the infected so you could catch back up to them. In it, you run into a Civil War display, which is something that also appears in the series as well. It was lined with cases that harboured old muskets and rifles, which are another thing that they perfectly bring across to the series. It was also an officer's uniform, and this appears in the lobby as they step inside. The building initially seems safe because the roots outside have rotted away, but the open door signals that something else is going on. They catch a staff member grown into the ground, there's also a recently killed soldier that has been ripped apart. Tess is optimistic that they were attacked outside and crawled in here to die, but all it does is signal that something else is in the building. Now for me, clickers were something that was gonna make or break the series. Normally in zombie stuff, you tend to get your typical grunt zombies, and it's rare that it goes beyond that outside of Resident Evil and Left 4 Dead. One of the big downsides of The Walking Dead is that they just kept the zombies and didn't really elevate things from there, so you had this repetitive enemy throughout. The clickers though, they add this new dimension, and playing those encounters for the first time in a dark room with headphones on was absolutely terrifying. If you so much as made a sound, then they would spring out of the darkness and grab you, the worst thing is, is that they were one hit kills. On high difficulties, even opening your backpack around them could alert the clickers to your location, and every encounter was as intense as a camping trip intense. Now I'm pleased to say that the show has managed to recapture the tense atmosphere of them, and I even found myself sitting in complete silence because of how nail biting it was. As they get through the door, the beams collapse, and even the shape of how it falls looks like how it is in the game. We see the mannequins in the display cases, and these add extra human shapes to the surroundings, really elevating the paranoia and fear in this scene. One appears behind a glass case, and I kinda got flashes of the T-Rex scene in Jurassic Park where, when they're in the jeep and the dinosaurs on the other side. The clickers suss them out and it leads to a big fight with two whilst Ellie crawls her way out and Joel uses sound to distract them. In the game he throws bottles and bricks, but he tips over a statue in order to draw one away. He's also able to keep his flashlight on, and in the game, absolutely none of the infected reacted to lights because the fungi just didn't pick up on it. Joel manages to reunite with Ellie, but the clicker senses them after they step on broken glass. 
You had to be really careful when navigating around them as there would often be piles on the floor that could alert them at any second. Anyway, they managed to take them down, but we later learned that Tess got bit during this. We're not sure exactly when this happens, but in the game, you find her pushed up against the cabinet and have to save her, which is when I've always thought that it happens there. Now as they step outside and she sits down, we can also catch a blood stain on her coat. This is probably where she got bit and my guess is that the clicker pulled back and then dribbled the blood from his bite onto her. Ali walks past a plank and this scene is pulled directly from the game. After escaping the museum, they have to cross one and we get an almost identical shot to that when she makes her way across the beam. Tess clearly knows she's on borrowed time too and she wants them to see the positive news in her surviving the bite rather than Joel's doom and gloom. Now we get this line pulled directly from the game. Is that everything you hoped for? Oh, is that everything you hoped for? Jury's still out. Jury's still out? But oh, man, you can't deny that view. But man, you can't deny that view. Hey, let's pick it up. Come on, let's get there before it's dark. Now Joel also looks longingly at his watch. This brief glance at it carries a lot of meaning, as it of course reminds him of Sarah. Ali sort of becomes a surrogate daughter to him, and it's almost like he has a moment remembering his old life before it all went to hell. This is a really important scene, as the watch of course broke when Sarah died. This was very much when the world ended as well, and time stopped for Joel in the exact same second that his watch broke. Anyway, they make their way into the building, with Joel still suspecting Ellie might not be the real deal. She has a bandage to cover her bite and in the game when you'd patch yourself up with a medikit, you could also see bandages like this over the wounds. Now after arriving at the state building, they see a truck full of dead firefly soldiers and also I think it's worth pointing out that Joel has an assault rifle for this whole episode, whereas in the game, I, I always saw him as being more of a pistol and shotgun man, but moving on. Now on the way to the location, you came across a soldier with a firefly log on his arm and he had a notey telling that they were gonna look after the girl. Inside they discover the dead, and we learn that one got bit, which led to everyone turning on each other. Tess is in this situation too, and after revealing her bite, they let her handle things on her own terms. Joel is actually a little bit apprehensive over this, and you can see as she comes towards him that he starts to step back. The scenes play out really similarly to the game, with us getting a few lines of dialogue that mirror each other here. Maybe they, uh, maybe they had a map or uh, something to tell us where they were going. I mean, one of them's got to have a map on them, right? Where was this lab of theirs? Where did Marlene say that she was taking you? Ellie. Oh, she never said. She only mentioned that it was someplace out west. Uh, I don't know. Just west. Just west. Fuck. Our luck had to run out sooner or later. Our luck had to run out sooner or later. She's infected. She's infected. I was bitten an hour ago, and it's already worse. This is fucking real, Joel. This is real. Joel, she's fucking real. Now, they do differentiate how a death plays out in the game, and after revealing her bite, we hear Fedra soldiers storming the area. Tess buys them some time to escape, and she stays behind to shoot it out with them, which is when she's eventually killed. Here, the infected are alerted, with them scrambling from the area before to swarm the state building. Tess tips over some explosive barrels and also some grenades so that she can take them all out. It's such a tense scene watching them close in as she struggles to spark up her lighter due to it not triggering and her hands trembling because of the infection. Tess is then given the kiss of death and she drops the lighter, taking them all out. Now in the game at this point, you descended into the subway station, which is where the Fedra followed you until you ran into some infected. They decided to cut their losses and leave and it led to you going further into the underground. Here though, I actually like the impact and the time that they give to Tess's death. You didn't really get a moment to breathe originally, but I just love the devastation that kind of washes over this scene. Joel as always continues moving, but Ellie stays still, hit with the realisation of just how quickly things can change in this world. It really is one of life and death, and it speaks to both their characters. In the game, Ellie would even press Joel to talk about Tess, and he'd refuse to because dwelling on it would make him face up to what happened. It's a devastating way to end the episode, with them now on the other side of the building, and that golden dome hanging over them in the background. Now that takes us into the super spoiler, super duper, trademark, greatest of all time, spoiler section, exclusive, exclusive, exclusive.
if you haven't played both games, then duck out now, and also please hit the thumbs up button on your way out. I love you. Anyway, there's a couple of things in this episode that link to larger parts of the game. Initially, when they talk about how the Fireflies are working on a cure, Joel says he's heard this a thousand times before, and he's extremely sceptical over it. Now, this could be the show setting up why he does what he does down the line, and Joel eventually gets Ellie to the Fireflies, but he learns that in order to make a cure, that Ellie has to die. Thus, he turns into Rambo and kills all the Fireflies and Surgeons before they can operate on her. This line here adds weight to him not believing that it's worth sacrificing her for something that might not even work, and I appreciate that they added it in. In this scene, Joel also refuses to let her have a gun when she asks. This was mirrored in the game as well, and it was only after the hotel where she saved his life that he started to begin trusting her. Now, the draft toy was also a nice little touch too. The end of the first game has a major scene in it in which Joel and Ellie come across them, and it shows that though humanity is doomed, there is hope for the rest of the world. Nature and wildlife has flourished, and it's one of the most memorable moments in that first game. And in the PlayStation Classic when they're in the hotel, they get a letter and climb up, which is when they run into bandits before making it to an elevator shaft. Here, everything goes to hell, and Ellie and Joel are cut off from each other, which is when you descend into the basement, into what's one of the most scariest parts of the game. I'm hoping they haven't skipped over this section, as it's so good, and in it, Joel basically navigates through the basement in what's one of the most tensest scenes of all time. In these dark and dank corridors, you run into Infected, and also a bloater, which Ellie touched upon earlier in the episode. She asked if rumours about the ones that threw toxic gas at people were true, and this is a reference to the giant infected that you run into in the game. The longer someone is infected, the longer they mutate, and in The Last of Us 2, you come across the Rat King in the basement of a hospital. This was ground zero for where it all went down, and on the day it kicked off, they destroyed the stairwells and ended up locking the doors. Thus he'd been down there for about uh, roughly 25 years. It was completely incredible how messed up he got. Now they also have some neat little nods to The Last of Us Part 2. Butterflies went beyond appearing in Episode 1, and we could also see one on Joel's guitar, and Ellie even got one as a tattoo. Huge shout out to Devony Maldonado for pointing out that the shirt Ellie wears in the second game is also the one that Joel's wearing throughout these episodes. Now lastly we have mention of Bill and Frank, and in the game this was the next location where Joel and Ellie went to. We discover that Frank had left Bill, and that he'd made his way to part of the town that Bill refused to venture to. However he did in order to help Joel and Ellie, and they went on to a school to get a military truck battery. This was an there, but they kept pushing through, and eventually found Frank's body, which is when they learned that he'd taken it. Frank had been bitten, so he'd taken his own life. It was pretty heartbreaking for Bill, even if he didn't show it. Now, judging by the trailers, it looks like they're changing things for next time, and we'll of course be back for that, so make sure you stay locked in. As for my thoughts on the episode, I think it was handled really well, and these two entries have been the best video game adaptations that I've ever seen. They nail the tone and aesthetic of the game, and every character is really knocking it out of the park in terms of their delivery and actions. Plus, the clickers were great too, and I love this trek through the landscape of an overgrown Boston that was full of danger. Now, I kind of wish they'd done the skyscraper bit in live action, but I can understand why that probably wasn't achievable without completely blowing the budget. There's also the hotel as well, which I hope wasn't the only time that it'll appear in the series, because both these locations had major moments with the infected that I think would translate so well to the show. After seeing how they handled the clickers, I was blown away by it, and I hope we get those bits, yeah? Fingers crossed we do. Now, obviously, I would love to hear your thoughts on the show, so make sure you comment below and let me know. If you want something else to watch, we've got a video linked on screen right now, and if you're watching this right after the show, then I appreciate you staying up late with me, and I hope to see you on the next one. You have a great week, more Last of Us stuff coming, and also take care of yourself. I'll see you next time. Peace.